So I'm now very pleased to welcome our second speakers this morning, Diane Pivik and James Taylor from Nga Tonga Sound and Vision. Diane has held several positions at Nga Tonga and is currently the head of the audience department for the archive. And James here is a fellow uh, research coordinator with responsibility for looking after public access to the moving image collection. Over recent years, Nga Tonga has been a key player in several World War I commemoration initiatives. These include Nga Tonga's partnership with the National Film and Sound Archive in Australia to produce an Anzac-themed website and their contribution to the Wellington City Council light shows for Embarkation Day in October 2014 and at the opening of Pukiaho Park in April this year. To hear all about this work and the digital challenges they faced along the way, it's now my pleasure to hand over to Diane and James. I just feel like a quick sound check. I'm normally fairly loud. Can you hear me? <laughs> awesome. I don't need a microphone. Thanks, Sarah. Kia ora koutou. World War I commemoration. Sorry, I can't give you the microphone. I think you have to have a microphone. It's not going to work on video. Okie dokie. Righto. How's that? All good? Kia ora koutou katoa. World War I commemorations have loomed large in our sector and most organisations have contributed in some way to, many, to the many events, exhibitions and publications that have proliferated since the beginning of the centenary last October. As the custodian of the largest collection of sound and moving images relating to Aotearoa and the war, Nga Taonga Sound and Vision has been flat out making material available for reuse. We have supplied film to more than 25 projects from the large scale, such as Te Papa's Gallipoli Exhibition and the television series Great War Stories, to performances such as Auckland Philharmonic's Soldier's Tales, Tales and to the Armed Man Dance Show. We have also supplied numerous clip, sound clips to projects and Radio New Zealand stories and documentaries. There was a flurry of activity around Anzac Day this year and as the commemoration rolls on, so do the requests for film and sound. We have worked on a number of our own projects and that is what James and I are here to talk about. But before we get to the projects, James will give us an overview of the World War I collection. Thanks, Light. So um, prior to the start of the World War I commemorative period, uh, the film archive held approximately 60 films that were shot during the First World War, as well as countless documentary shorts and TV programs that have been made since. Um, these films came to the archive from a number of different sources. Some were part of the National Film Library collection. Uh, others were, have come from private depositors, and we've also received copies from archives in the UK and Australia. Over the years, these have been preserved to film or tally cined, with access copies made available on VHS, DVD, or more recently as digital files. From the late 1980s, the archives worked with the military historian Chris Pugsley to identify and to closely catalogue this collection, and he was awarded a stout fellowship to do the majority of this work in 1990. Um, so the films in the World War I collection are all silent and black and white, as you can imagine. They show troop departures, training and fundraising at home, through to NZDFE soldiers uh, serving overseas at Gallipoli, the Western Front and in the Middle East, and they were made by cameramen connected to local cinemas or to official government or uh, New Zealand Army cinematographers. There's no footage of action or fighting per se, which is what people often ask us for. Um, the camera technology of the time was big and bulky, and to aim a camera above a trench was an invitation to a sniper for a free shot. However, we do see trench conditions, we, seen, we see scenes of no man's land, and lots of troop inspections, drills and marching. While much of the action is staged, uh, the shattered landscape isn't fake, nor are the often exhausted soldiers, though it's remarkable how often um, they perk up when a camera is nearby. So as with many other GLAMs, funding from the Lottery Grants World War I Fund enabled us to undertake two major projects. The first, Sights and Sounds of the Great War, was a project planned in five phases. First, repatriation, to locate and retrieve original film material relating to New Zealand's participation in and experience of World War I from archives in Australia, France and the UK, and which James will talk about soon. Two, to research, compile a comprehensive catalogue information about all the World War I holdings in the archive collection. James has already mentioned our work with Chris Pugsley. In this current project, we have added more information to those original records, and we've also begun cataloguing the newly repatriated material too. 
And the research phase also included the sound archives, Nga Taonga Kōrero collection, and all of the World War I audio material has been catalogued. In case you don't know, Nga Taonga is a recent merger of the former film archive, Radio New Zealand Sound Archive, and Television New Zealand Archive. So we suddenly had a wonderful collection of um, sound as well. Um, Fourth, preservation, third actually, preservation. Ensure all material held in the Nga Taonga collection is preserved to the highest possible standards. All of the film shot at the time of the war was made on 35 millimeter nitrate stock. And in most cases, the nitrate film in our collections had already been transferred to safety film. However, ongoing research of the foreign collection of nitrate has located new film in our vault that relates to the war. Most significantly, we have found an episode from the series Whirlpool of War, which was, th which was thought to be lost to the world. It is now undergoing preservation work to prepare the nitrate for scanning. Digitization. Scan and transfer all the material collected as part of the project to uncompressed, high resolution digital formats. We have been working hard to transfer all of the World War I collection to high quality digital file formats, both for preservation and access. As Margaret says, it's a really labour intensive and long process. For film, it's a real time situation. It takes longer than the film itself. To achieve this, we have worked with Park Road Post and internally with our own RE scanner to ensure we have high resolution, uncompressed master files, as well as access files in a variety of codecs and at different levels of compression to suit different purposes, such as web delivery, television broadcast, cinema screenings and good research viewing copies. And fifth, access. The funding application suggested three areas for access. First, a website to be built in collaboration with our Australian colleagues at the Film and Sound Archive. Second, to provide AV materials for use in other productions. And third, use project material in the widest possible variety of public programs. As I mentioned earlier, we have been busy providing access to clients for re use in other projects. And since Embarkation Day last year, we have also presented a number of screenings and papers at conferences. We have uploaded the new catalogue records to the website, in some cases with viewing files, and that will continue over the next few years. Our highlight has been our partnership with Wellington City Council and Sarah Hunter, where we worked first in October 2014 on the Embarkation Day light show projections onto Shed 10 and St James. And in April this year, on World War I Remembered, light and sound show at Pukeahu Park. And we have created <coughs> and launched anzacsitesound.org. We'll talk more about the access projects in a minute, but James will first of all go over the repatriation results. Okay, so when our uh, World War I project began in 2013, we had a pretty good idea of what we had in the collection uh, and also what films were missing or lost based on records at Archives New Zealand. However, there was another third group of films, uh, which are those featuring New Zealand or New Zealanders that survived in archives overseas. Chris Pugsley has again been responsible for much of the detective work here, tracking down films in archives such as the Imperial War Museum, as have other film archive staff members over the past couple of decades. And of course, online databases have made the job much easier recently. It's this group of films that make up the repatriation side of the project. So before talking in more detail about this, why are so many films held in archives elsewhere? In part it's reflective of film as a form of mass media and the way that film moved throughout the world via its various distribution networks and circuits. But it's also the result of a couple of particular historical circumstances. One is that all the films shot by the New Zealand Army cameramen uh, during the war were censored by the War Office Cinematograph Committee. Uh, the material which survived there was later deposited at the Imperial War Museum. However, most of the films were found at British Pathé, um, and this is because of the New Zealand government's long-standing relationship with Pathé Freres, which was one of the largest newsreel companies in the first half of the 20th century. This dated back to prior to the war, when Pathé filmed and distributed scenic uh, material promoting the country as a tourist destination. This relationship continued throughout the war, and in 1916 Pathé cameramen uh, were contracted to the NZDF as official war cinematographers and still photographers, and so the photos um, that they took make up the H-series collection, which is available at the National Library. In return for providing cameramen, Pathé gained the rights to use the films in their newsreels, which were shown around the world. Because of this, most but not all of the film that survives here are short stories or excerpts from newsreels. So over 100 films were identified in commercial and non-commercial government archives in Australia, the United Kingdom, USA and Europe. Uh, and the process of repatriation or bringing them back to New Zealand shows how much things have changed in the world of film archiving in the past decade. In years past, repatriation would have involved the transfer of a physical object, either the nitrate original or a 16 or 35 mil copy. 
Uh, the project this time around has almost entirely been based on exchanging digital files. Over the last couple of years, we've negotiated the purchase or transfer of films from the eight archives you can see on this slide. So we worked with the National Film and Sound Archive of Australia, the Australian War Memorial, the British Film Institute, the Imperial War Museum, Gaumont Pathé, British Pathé, ECPAD, which is the French Military Audiovisual Archive, and Critical Pass, which uh, is a US-based stock footage outfit. We received a really good response from our fellow FIAF member archives. So the BFI sent nine films out to be scanned here. The IWM, AWM and NFSA all provided new scans free of charge. On the other hand, Gaumont Pathé, British Pathé and Critical Past, all of whom are commercial archives, were more than happy to take our money. While this was a slow moving process, the only real hiccup has been one of the French archives not wanting to communicate with us in English. Um, it's been a very interesting process dealing with them. Um, so in all we've got 97 new films acquired into the collection and they've really enhanced uh, the World War I film collection. So amongst them are films shot at Gallipoli, in Europe, the Middle East and in occupied Germany. Uh, the, they show troops at play on the rugby field and some lighter moments of rest and recuperation. We also have some really rare films showing soldiers leaving England and including uh, and with them were some of the new wives and the babies that they took back with them. Um, and the good news is that the licenses that we negotiated with the commercial archives and with some of our FIAF partners allows us to dis distribute these films to non-commercial clients, particularly GLAMs, for use in New Zealand um, instead of institutions having to pay the fairly hefty uh, commercial rates that they usually would have to. So once the acquisition project is wrapped up, which will hopefully by the end of, by, be by the mid next month, we'll have some more details on our website. Um, as Di's already mentioned, we've done quite a lot of digital preservation work on the nitrate films that are already in the collection. This involved making new scans and the results are quite remarkable. So I'm going to show you now one example, which is a before and after clip of the visit of the battleship HMS New Zealand. Uh, oh no. There we go. So this is a film that was shot by Charles Newham in 1913 when HMS New Zealand visited. You can't see it that well, but this is uh, the digital copy that we had basically available prior to this project start starting. So I have a brief glimpse of this, and you can tell it's very dark. Um, there's not much, not not much detail can be seen or anything like that. It's hard to recognise that there's people on the bridge. And so this is the result of the 4K scan. And so the first thing you can see is that the scanner actually takes a colour. And so that title was actually tinted by the, by the cameraman before he produced it. And then this is the brand new scan. Um, you'll see it side to side soon. And the results are pretty remarkable in terms of their difference. And this isn't as high res. We've got a DCP back at the archive where the, the footage looks, looks absolutely amazing. But you can see that the image has been stabilised, you can see the soldiers on the deck, you can actually also see faces poking through the portholes there, uh, the reflection of the boat in the water. It's a huge, makes a huge difference. And as, as I was saying um, to someone last night, this is the way that people would have actually seen it in the cinemas back in 1913, where else we have an idea that old footage is a sort of old, muggy, murky, murky thing. And this is uh, the boats in the harbour where Newham was filming the, filming the ship. And you can even see the costumes and the outfits that the women and the, the men are wearing. It's quite remarkable. And it's particularly remarkable when you think that Charles Newham would have been on a boat with a great big camera with no stabilisation at all, not even a little handheld um, to do that. But the funding application specified the creation of a website in partnership with our colleagues at the Australian National Film and Sound Archive. The site, showcasing the sights and sound of Australia and New Zealand's experience of World War I, was launched in April this year. The build began in February 2014 when we went to Sydney to meet colleagues and create a project plan. It was an interesting meeting. We were outnumbered by about 10 to 2 and the differences in our processes soon became obvious. NFSA is a government department and employs around 300 people. Ngā Taonga Sound and Vision is a charitable trust with around 80 staff, and even this is recent. Three years ago there was around half that number. They have a lot more documentation and process than us. 
and even the template for project management was about 90 pages long, a totally foreign language. One thing that we did have in common was that both organisations were going through major transformations at the time, and this had an ongoing effect on the project, especially because the NFSA's restructure included staffing changes, and consequently the Australian team changed completely, regularly. It was a fun meeting though. Inevitably we got sidetracked by war stories and collection items and what to call the site. We talked about must-haves, nice-to-haves and got briefly bamboozled by the Aussie Tech Department and details of Australian Government internet policy. We came away with a vague idea for a website that was dense with essays and information that would be supported by the AV record. Disastrously, instead of foregrounding the audiovisual, we were imagining a wordy site that would have some nice videos and a little bit of audio to support the text. Fortunately, as funders, we had the final word. The site would be built and hosted in New Zealand, and we would lead the project management. We agreed to keep the URL anonymous in case of parochial, parochialism on either side of the Tasman, and because the site would be hosted here, we were able to navigate some of the trickier issues we'd have to have had addressed if, we, if the site was coming from a department of the Australian Government. We worked with Boost New Media to build the site, and from the outset began refining the project less and less text. We went from thinking to four to six essays and double that of shorter essays to just one, a set of collection stories and short vignettes to describe the content. The text was written by staff from both archives and we employed Mark Darby to create a site style to give consistency and tone. We have translated some of the vignettes into Te Reo Māori and have plans to translate all of the New Zealand content by the end of this year. We shifted to foregrounding the audiovisual. This meant full screen video and sound players and small amounts of text. We've also added further information in a more traditional style and as much as possible point users to other websites for further reference. This was also our first time working with Agile. The initial leap of faith was offset by daily stand-ups, fortnightly planning and review cycles and daily contact through Basecamp. It was great to see the pieces unfold and the site grow. Using Basecamp was also helpful in bringing the team in Christchurch, Wellington, Sydney and Canberra together and especially good for ongoing dialogue and keeping everybody informed about progress. The site was launched in Wellington in April and again in Sydney during the FIAF Congress this year. Traffic took off with a hiss and a roar. In particular, a video of the first Māori contingent performing a haka was watched over 5,000 times within a few days of launch. Alright, so now I'm going to try a live site demo which is something that's always slightly fraught with risk so hopefully this works okay Anzac site sound it's already in there there you go um so this is the site i'm just going to click through until i can find a new zealand film here so what you can see i mean the first thing to notice about the site is that the the users drop straight into a into an item when they when they uh chuck the URL into the box so one will come up eventually I'm sure um, la, la, la. and you'll also notice that there's a wash of color so one thing that we decided quite early on well, we we're very conscious of how to make this black and white footage a lot of it's of soldiers marching you know it's very foreign to a to a modern audience how to uh, how to make it accessible for them so I'm sure there's one got to be one here somewhere <laughs> That was one. Ah, that was one. Okay, so flower power. So this is a. Um, so so that's what we were trying to do. So we're giving the item snappy names. You can see here that there's this sort of little story that goes with each item to kind of to try to draw the viewer in. So this is the work that Mark did. Both each archive wrote, but Mark did a lot of the editing for us. Um, and then as you can see, press play here, and you drop straight into full screen video. This is another one of our newly screen uh, newly scanned items. Um, so the viewers, viewers drop straight into to high def full screen video. If we go back, you notice that it still plays in the background. Um, but we've got a lot of extra contextual information here as well. So more information uh, has a little bit of metadata here. There's a reference back to the catalogue. Uh, we have people that are uh, hyperlinked. So if William Massey shows up in more than two or three clips, you can click through and see the films that sh show him. Location, we've got a mapping function. There's also a bit more context here as well as related links to other, uh, other online resources. Um, 
this one doesn't have a shot list, but a lot of the films have shot lists with them. We've also got your usual share uh, buttons and also comments. So no comments on this one, but we have had quite a few comments from various people. Um, and there's also this feature here about seeing someone that you know and emailing us. So one thing that we'd like to explore a little bit more, and especially if there's anyone from Cenotaph here, is just linking some of the, the films that we have of the various uh, divisions and regiments up to Cenotaph. Um, as we go into the site, the actual navigation you can see, so we've divided it into three broad, broad themes. Home fronts, uh, which is footage and sound of uh, what was happening in Australia and New Zealand. Battle fronts, uh, with the main focus on Gallipoli this time around. And there's also an aftermath, aftermath section which will feature some of the um, Anzac Day collection films that we've got. We've got a really amazing collection of Anzac Day parades from the very first one in London going right through to the 1970s. Um, and so within this, then we have our sets, our collections. So for example, here's the Gallipoli campaign. You can see a contextual essay here that was written by, by Chris, and then all the, um, the different items here. So just to give you an example of sound, uh, we will just click on this one. So this is what a sound item looks like again, and just press play and it goes straight straight into it. That's a nice little story. Uh, we also have documentation, so images on here. We haven't brought in any of our images yet, but there's a lot from the Australian collection. So that's what the images look like. And um, so this was all made possible uh, on a custom CMS that was built using Ruby on Rails and developed by a really talented team at Boost New Media. Um, so, uh, as I said, like as you can see, this is a sort of organic website, and we can we plan on continuing to update it over the the remaining period of the commemoration period. So we'll be bringing in more footage of the soldiers at war. We'll also talk about cinema going um, during the war. Uh, in an update that's coming next month, and we'll also highlight the preservation work and AV archiving uh, that both organisations do. There's Anzac updates in the aftermath theme, um, and we'll also be bringing in contemporary short films, TV programmes and documentaries. And I see that we've got two minutes, left, so maybe we might skip over the loan programme. So keep an eye out for the loan programme that's coming mid next month. Um, we'll just briefly mention that... Um, Fernleaf Lads in the Trenches will be coming middle of next month. It's a 70 minute program that will be free to loan to schools and institutions and clubs and groups. So if we maybe move on to the conclusion. And I will do that bit as well because that's me too. So um, just to quickly wrap up, um, the first thing to note is that we have uh, 150 moving image items now in the World War I film collection. The newly acquired items will be catalogued in detail over the next year, and the entire World War I sound catalog uh, collection has been catalogued in detail as well. The repatriation project involved working with overseas archives, and we got a really good response, particularly from our fellow FIAF uh, members, so we're really pleased to have worked towards one of the main aims of the World War I commemorations, which was to cooperate across national borders with institutions and colleagues in the UK, Australia and Europe, and we're also pleased that we'll be able to offer uh, this material to GLAMS much, much cheaper than it would have been otherwise. Another um, lesson we learned was partnerships, working with Australia, and I don't mean that jingoistically, it could be working with anybody, but if you're making a partnership, it pays to do some due diligence. Have you got the same ideas? Are your themes similar? Have you got the same outcome? Do your collections support or actually are there strengths? Are there differences? Um, ha how does each country remember or how does each partner remember and how can you build together? One of the um, early things we found was we had to tone down the celebratory aspect, which Australia's really good at, but there's a huge difference, as Margaret alluded to, which is conscription. And in 1916, New Zealand introduced conscription. So we very much remember the war, we commemorate the war, whereas in Australia, there wasn't conscription. Men volunteered to go. So it's very much about heroes, it's about celebration, it's about recognising those men who volunteered and went to war. In New Zealand, we're a little bit more circumspect about that. Um, the other point is that this was actually the first project that we uh, undertook as a new, newly merged AV archive and it was, so it was the first time that we worked on a public program with our colleagues in the sound archives. Um, the sound collection really complements the film, films well and vice versa um, and they sort of fill the gaps in the collection really nicely. So um, we think that the ANZAC website demonstrates the strength of our newly combined archive and we're really pleased with the way that it turned out at a time that was quite difficult for a lot of people involved. 
Another thing we learnt, which I'm sure is a no-brainer for everybody, but there's a huge appetite for the war. Um, Margaret alluded to it. In the build-up to April this year, we were run off our feet. Everybody wanted to do something for Anzac Day. We found that things mostly come in bursts, particularly around anniversaries. Chunuk Bear, we were busy again. We're gearing up for Mazines and all of the other commemorations that are coming. Um, and one thing that we're really learning is it was a long war. We're enduring it. But imagine what it was like 100 years ago. <laughs> Um, and just finally to wrap things up, we understand that there's some ambivalence about the resources that have been poured into the various World War I centenary projects both inside and outside the heritage sector, especially when as this conference shows there's so many other worthy projects out there that don't have much money. Um, and me and I both certainly share this ambivalence and as she just said it's been a long war already. Um, however the funding that has been available has given us a chance to experiment with our public programs and we hope that one of the real lasting legacies of these various World War I projects is that it's allowed us opportunity to rethink and to revise how we present archival footage by blending the best of analogue media with digital preservation and new technology. Thank you. Thank you very much both Margaret and James uh, and also to, uh, sorry, Diane, Diane and James and to Margaret earlier, some really great insights from you there. Um, we're just on 12 o'clock, uh, lunch will be served in Oceana shortly. Um, we do have an hour and a half for lunch today and I'm conscious we haven't had opportunity for questions. So those of you who have got prior commitments and do need to depart, please um, do so. If you'd like to hang around for a few more minutes, I would like to open up the floor for questions for all of our speakers. So, uh, questions? So I, I know that there were share buttons, but is, yep. are we able to download footage or are there embed codes that we can use? Are we allowed to reuse your stuff? Um, we're still working through reuse. We hope we'll hopefully be able to offer something along those lines next year. But yeah, that's something that we're still working on at the moment. So if we wanted to use it in a program on our site, yeah, we can't do that at the moment. You'd have to. Have you need to contact us in the first instance. So with the repatriated material, we've worked through agreements with those people so yep. that we can make it available. It's just the getting the digital files is taking some time, so we're still coming up to speed. So it, it, unfortunately at the moment, you can't embed from the site. We also ran out of budget. Um, but if you contact us, we can help you out. Yeah. Thank you. My question's actually for Margaret. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk about how you dealt with the cultural safety implications of using Aboriginal images in Australia. And yeah, I'll leave it there. You can. <laughs> if you were an Indigenous person, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, you weren't allowed to enlist. And so, um, Anyone who did, and there were lots, particularly from Queensland, either hid their Aboriginality or um, the recruiting officer turned an eye um, sideways. So it's almost impossible to identify Indigenous servicemen from their portraits. Um, so because they were already publicly available, we didn't, uh, you know, there were no sort of considerations around that within this project. Generally speaking, when we have um, uh, pictures that are, you know, from our from our archival collections that um, display, uh, display people um, of Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander um, um, ancestry. We talk to the communities and do a community clearance project so, process. So we'll take a bunch of content out. The, the the elders or the family will look at it and they'll say, "Yep, that's fine." Or, "Gee, we don't want that image made public." So that's the, sort of the standard process. With this, there was no way. There's absolutely no way to identify who's an Indigenous service person um, in those images. And if you look at say Valentine Hare for example, it's only if you really, really look closely and you already know he's um, an Aboriginal man, you can possibly say yes, he's, he's an Aboriginal man, but otherwise it's, it's very difficult to find them. Okay, any more questions? Okay, well please join with me again in thanking both Margaret and Diane.